The film begins with Conan as a child learning about Krom and the Riddle of Steel until he's orphaned after the assault by Thalsa Doom and his minions and sent off to spend his childhood on the Wheel of Pain, grinding grain all day by pushing a giant millstone. From the beginning, the film establishes that it is largely following the famous hero's journey concept of Joseph Campbell, starting with the ordinary world, the peaceful life he had. Then there is the call of adventure, the attack on the village, and the refusal of the call, his attempt to hide during this, the result of which being him surviving, but as a slave. Conan is then purchased to fight in gladiatorial matches, but while this is brutal and cruel, it seems Conan quickly demonstrates a knack for this, thus the meeting the mentor step. Not in the typical way, obviously, but nevertheless Conan is soon being educated in the sword, in reading, in battle, in the ways of the world. And in the end, the one who allowed him to do that grants Conan his freedom, without him ever asking for it. He escapes to what proves to be the ruins of Atlantis, where he recovers the old king's sword, frees it from its cage of filth, and it in turn frees him of his literal chains. This, of course, is him crossing the threshold, leaving behind that life for his own. After that, it's immediately Tess's allies and enemies. The test with the witch in her hut, his allies in Subatai and Valeria, and the enemies in Thalsa Duman and his followers, who are now cultists. It's during this that he comes across the snake and does battle which, as mentioned, is quite good, using very effective special effects to make a practical prop move like an actual snake would. As a brief diversion, I'm going to include something that I had, well, cut from my jackass look at the film, because the bots ding videos that are too long, so I had to just chop the whole section out. So, here's when the snake fight prompts me to reflect upon both this film and its imitators. Some of it's a little silly, but mostly it's serious. You know, I don't want to say anything because this is going to make me look stupid, but I saw the Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode of Cave Dwellers a lot. Look out, it's Coco the Terrible! See, Cave Dwellers is a goofball upon a goofball situation, and that was originally the second Ator film, an Italian Conan ripoff, hence the second goofball. The first was that this Ator film was picked up by Film Ventures International after being bought by a shady little TV syndication company called INI, who bought the rights to clips from a movie, and then they would chop off the credits and titles of that movie, made their own credits and titles, and then showed the entire rest of the film as one extremely long clip, and then just retitled it. Oh. Hey, chicken head. <laughs> hey, chicken head. <laughs> but yeah. I bring that up because I saw the Cave Dwellers a lot and hadn't seen Conan the Barbarian, so it really is funny seeing all the stuff that Cave Dwellers blatantly ripped off in a clearly worse way than this movie. A snake fight there is especially what comes to mind. This is really not bad special effects at all for 1982, not at all. And I think that's kind of the reason I brought Cave Dwellers up in that when I think about that rip off against this one, it shows how others might try to ape it. When I look at Jaws clones, I see where the aping falls because they steal the surface of Jaws, not what lies underneath, to move it from a great monster movie to a great classic film. When I look at Conan the Barbarian against Cave Dwellers, I'm really impressed with uh, Miso Sen of the work. When I put this film against any ripoff, really, it makes me truly realize how artistic this is. Now let's just stop for a little while and appreciate the artistic aspects of this, the way that all of those elements come together to form what you see on the screen there. One, the setting and locations. This film makes extensive use of natural landscapes in Spain, from arid deserts to rugged mountains. The practical sets like the stone cities and temples that I mentioned before, they're expansive and detailed, and most importantly, they look like they should be there. These locations and sets convey a world that is ancient, mythical, and brutal. Two, the costumes. The clothing defines the characters and the world they ha inhabit. Just take a look for a moment at Conan's progression in the film with his changing attire. 
from child to slave to gladiator to warrior. His clothing reflects that. The props. Conan's sword, the eye of the serpent gem, the wheel of pain. These are more than things or even narrative tools. These are symbols. The sword is Conan's legacy, which he frees from its rot by striking against the stones. And it's also his freedom, as it is the sword that finally is what severs his chains. The eye of the serpent gem is the symbol of the mesmerizing allure of doom, which can compel those to step into certain death. The wheel of pain is Conan's resilience in the face of suffering, that he only grows stronger from his torment. 4. Physicality and Movement What would this film be without the physique of Arnold Schwarzenegger, his imposing stature, the way he moves, the way he wields his sword? He plays a barbarian, yet there is grace and steadiness to it. And even getting into the technical aspects of the filming itself. The film uses natural and artificial light to create its mood and atmosphere very well. The color palette is naturalistic in the rough world out there and colorful within civilization. Yet in keeping with the theme, its color is similar to the way that poisonous animals are colorful. Color says, I'm dangerous. And of course, the cinematography, making great use of the 2.35 aspect ratio for capturing the enormity of the world, showing the grandeur of the landscapes, the sets, the armies of extras, and still capturing the intensity and brutality of the action scenes. And keep in mind, I haven't seen this film until a week ago. I'm not speaking from a place of nostalgia, from someone who decades ago loved this film and hasn't forgotten about it. I'm looking at this with fresh eyes and telling you it really stands out all the more for its artistry. To return to the Tess's allies and enemies, Conan and friends soon meet King Osric, who bestows riches on them if they would return his wayward daughter, and also meeting the Wizard of the Mounds, played by Mako, who provides pivotal help later on. But it is when the approach to the innermost cave section of the hero's journey arrives. Conan's attempt to infiltrate the Temple of Set, that we again encounter Thalsa Doom, now a cult leader who demonstrates his power exceeds that of steel, because at a word, a woman steps into midair to fall to her death, simply because he commanded it. I said that Conan's evolution was to warrior, but on reflection, it might be more accurate to say he evolved from warrior to barbarian. Let me explain. Conan's famous line that the best things in life are to crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentations of their women, are said while he was still a slave, still fighting for the entertainment of others. What's more, Conan's line, adapted from something attributed to Genghis Khan, reflects the actions of Thulsa Doom at the beginning of the film, the clear annihilation of his people by this man. Perhaps we should consider that Conan as a gladiator and Thulsa Doom as a raider are both the same, both interested solely in the fruits of victory that come from the vanquishing of another. However, starting from that same warrior viewpoint, the two men evolve in separate opposing directions, because their power started in opposing places. Thulsa Doom's power was through the number of warriors he led into battle. It was his ability to lead that gave him strength, so he evolved that leading to gain even greater strength. Conan's power was completely internal. It was mastery of himself, his physicality and growth. So he evolved inwardly. I recognize no code of laws, only a code of honor. Thulsa Doom symbolizes the corrupting power of civilization and Conan the literal liberation of the barbarian. Thalsa Doom has evolved his power so that he only kills with flesh, not steel. He kills with a word and a gesture, and it compels others to make his will manifest. And when he does kill himself, it is with a snake as a weapon. Flesh. Even his method of attempting to kill Conan fits this. Crucifixion. Because it's a form of execution where the flesh is turned against itself where the simple strain of supporting the body for so long leads to asphyxiation or possibly heart failure of some kind. Conan is a barbarian, but not in the sense of being a savage, in the sense that he disassociates himself from the laws of men 
and instead embraces natural law. This paints Conan's journey as a rejection of the corrupt forms of civilization, represented by Doom's false and oppressive cult, in favor of a life guided by a personal code of honor, one that prizes individual strength, courage, and loyalty over the deceptive enlightenment, security, and order that Doom offers. In this way, Conan's journey is a search for authentic existence, one that is free from the corrupting influences of power and domination that Doom embodies. The hero's journey often involves the easy temptation of power by staying true to a moral code. Conan rejects not just civilization, but the previous warrior philosophy. If he were to express it in words, it might be, I've had the best things in life. Now I want something better. The touch of a lover, the companionship of a friend, and the freedom to walk this world unburdened. After demonstrating his power by having the woman jump to her death, Thalsa Doom chastises Conan by saying that the strength and drive and all that he has must be credited to Doom himself. In light of what was just discussed, you can see the dual points of this. Doom uses words, claims power, steals something he has no right to, because that's where his power lies. What he wants to claim is the internal strength of Conan. His exact words, I gave you, overstates his role in this. He was nothing but a tragedy that Conan rose above, yet Doom claims Conan's rise was a gift from him. While the Nietzsche phrase, that which does not kill me makes me stronger, is a large part of the film's view of Conan, it is to reflect the resilience of the individual in the face of an aggressor, not a credit to the aggressor. The phrase isn't a truism, after all. Plenty of things that don't kill you leave you worse off a fact some who are still impacted by their corona infection could probably attest to. But no, the phrase is meant to represent a philosophy, that if anything knocks me down, like Antaeus, I will only get up stronger. The credit is not to one who can knock down, it's to one who can get back up. My examination of this film is, of course, from the perspective of its themes, not necessarily an endorsement of their viewpoint. It's merely that the film presents a perspective on the civilized man at his darkest and the barbarian at his most noble. Conan is a thief, but he doesn't pretend to be otherwise. Paradoxically, his theft is honest because it is acknowledged for what it is. But Doom's theft comes in a far more insidious form. His theft is carried out by words, gaining that which he has no right to merely because he acts as if he does, that indeed it is more rightfully his. Even the life of one of those who follows him, he presumes it belongs to him, to use and to discard as he wishes. Doom has Conan crucified, though his friend rescues him, and thanks to the magic of the wizard and the axe of Valeria his lover, Conan recovers to fight on again. These represent the steps of the hero's journey of the ordeal, the road back, and the almost literal resurrection. The princess is recovered, though Valeria falls, and when Doom rides against him, Conan wipes out his forces, and is free to return to the Temple of Set for the final confrontation. The last stage of the hero's journey is the return with the elixir, when the hero returns to bring healing to others. How he does so is seen when Doom responds to Conan's presence by arguing more than just the giver of Conan's strength, but that he is Conan's father, to claim his very existence is a credit to Thalsa Doom. Conan's response, to behead Doom before his followers, is that healing, as it allows the people to finally be cured from the poison of Doom's words, to show them undeniably he is merely a liar with empty promises. Extinguishing their torches and walking away shows the elixir has done its work, and Conan's journey is complete. He has not usurped Doom's place, note. He could have, but he gives them freedom and self-determination once again, that they will find strength from within themselves now that they are no longer looking to a charlatan for the answers. Yet, how does this idea square with the closing of the film that declares Conan became a king? I showed you repeatedly the image of Conan seated upon a throne, after all. But this returns to the concept of honor, especially in an honored-centered group. A code of honor is more than to thine own self be true. 
It is instead following a way of conduct, exemplifying virtues such as strength, courage, and cunning. One with a code of honor has mutual respect with another who likewise follows that code. So Conan's embodiment of those virtues would have him seen as a man of honor, as implied by the ending text. And the great deeds of someone within that code is given special recognition from the others who adhere to that code. Conan thus becoming king is the flip side of Doom's ascent. Conan would be elevated by those who are convinced of his greatness by his actions, not deceived into believing it through empty lies and rhetoric. Conan's followers believe in the things he does, not in the hollow assertions of a false prophet. In becoming king, Conan fulfills the monomyth role as someone who attains this elevated position through the will of the people, that he is one of them. For embodying the greatest of the virtues, he is elevated to their greatest position.